Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Well, it's autumn, and that always makes me think of my most favorite place on earth, Scotland. So tonight, let's take a relaxing journey with Edinburgh. Picturesque Notes by Robert Louis Stevenson First published in 1878 and reprinted as the People's Edition in 1903 by Seely and Co. Limited, 38 Great Russell Street, London. Let's begin. Chapter 1 Introductory the ancient and famous metropolis of the north sits overlooking a windy estuary from the slope and summit of three hills. No situation could be more commanding for the head city of a kingdom, none better chosen for noble prospects. From her tall precipice and terraced gardens, she looks far and wide on the sea and broad champagnes. To the east you may catch at sunset the spark of the May lighthouse, where the Firth expands into the German Ocean, and away to the west, over all the Carse of Stirling, you can see the first snows upon Ben Ledi. But Edinburgh pays cruelly for her high seat in one of the vilest climates under heaven. She is liable to be beaten upon by all the winds that blow, to be drenched with rain, to be buried in cold sea fogs out of the east, and powdered with the snow as it comes flying southward from the highland hills. The weather is raw and boisterous in winter, shifty and ungenial in summer, and a downright meteorological purgatory in the spring. The delicate die early, and I, as a survivor, among bleak winds and plumping rain, have been sometimes tempted to envy them their fate. For all who love shelter and the blessings of the sun who hate dark weather and perpetual tilting against squalls, there could scarcely be found a more unhomely and harassing place of residence. Many such aspire angrily after that somewhere else of the imagination, where all troubles are supposed to end. They lean over the great bridge which joins the new town with the old, that windiest spot, or high altar, in this northern temple of the winds, and watch the trains smoking out from under them and vanishing into the tunnel on a voyage to brighter skies. Happy the passengers who shake off the dust of Edinburgh and have heard for the last time the cry of the east wind among her chimney tops. And yet... The place establishes an interest in people's hearts. Go where they will, they find no city of the same distinction. Go where they will, they take a pride in their old home. Venice, it has been said, differs from other cities in the sentiment which she inspires. The rest may have admirers. She only, a famous fair one counts lovers in her train. And indeed, even by her kindest friends, Edinburgh is not considered in a similar sense. These like her for many reasons, not any one of which is satisfactory in itself. They like her whimsically, if you will, 
and somewhat as a virtuoso dotes upon his cabinet. Her attraction is romantic in the narrowest meaning of the term. Beautiful as she is, she is not so much beautiful as interesting. She is preeminently gothic, and all the more so, since she has set herself off with some Greek airs and erected classic temples on her crags. In a word, and above all, she is a curiosity. The Palace of Holyrood has been left aside in the growth of Edinburgh, and stands grey and silent in a workman's quarter and among breweries and gasworks. It is a house of many memories. Great people of yore, kings and queens, buffoons and grave ambassadors, played their stately farce for centuries in Holyrood. Wars have been plotted. Dancing has lasted deep into the night. Murder has been done in its chambers. There Prince Charlie held his phantom levies, and in a very gallant manner represented a fallen dynasty for some hours. Now all these things of clay are mingled with the dust. The king's crown itself is shown for sixpence to the vulgar. But the stone palace has outlived these charges. For fifty weeks together it is no more than a show for tourists and a museum of old furniture. But on the fifty-first, behold the palace reawakened and mimicking its past. The Lord Commissioner, a kind of stage sovereign, sits among stage courtiers. A coach and six and clattering escort come and go before the gate. At night the windows are lighted up, and its near neighbors, the workmen, may dance in their own houses to the palace music. And in this the palace is typical. There is a spark among the embers. From time to time the old volcano smokes. Edinburgh has but partly abdicated and still wears in parody her metropolitan trappings. Half a capital and half a country town, the whole city leads a double existence. It has long traces of the one and flashes of the other. Like the king of the Black Isles, it is half alive and half a monumental marble. There are armed men and cannon in the citadel overhead. You may see the troops marshaled on the high parade, and at night, after the early winter evenfall, and in the morning before the laggard winter dawn, the wind carries abroad over Edinburgh the sound of drums and bugles. Grave judges sit bewigged in what was once the scene of imperial deliberations. Close by in the high street, perhaps, the trumpets may sound about the stroke of noon, and you see a troop of citizens in tawdry masquerade Tabard above, heather mixture trousers below, and the men themselves trudging in the mud among unsympathetic bystanders. The grooms of a well-appointed circus tread the streets with a better presence, and yet these are the heralds and pursuivants of Scotland, who are about to proclaim a new law of the United Kingdom before two-score boys and thieves and hackney coachmen. Meanwhile, every hour the bell of the university rings out over the hum of the streets, and every hour a double tide of students, coming and going, fills the deep archways. And lastly, one night in the springtime, or say, one morning rather, at the peep of day, Late folk may hear voices of many men singing a psalm in unison from a church on one side of the old high street. And a little after, or perhaps a little before, the sound of many men singing a psalm in unison from another church on the opposite side of the way. There will be something in the words above the dew of Hermon 
and how goodly it is to see brethren dwelling together in unity. And the late folk will tell themselves that all this singing denotes the conclusion of two yearly ecclesiastical parliaments, the parliaments of churches which are brothers in many admirable virtues, but not specially like brothers in this particular of a tolerant and peaceful life. Again, meditative people will find a charm in a certain consonancy between the aspect of the city and its odd and stirring history. Few places, if any, offer a more barbaric display of contrast to the eye. In the very midst stands one of the most satisfactory crags in nature, a base rock upon dry land rooted in a garden shaken by passing trains, carrying a crown of battlements and turrets, and describing its warlike shadow over the liveliest and brightest thoroughfare of the new town. From their smoky beehives ten stories high, the unwashed looked down upon the open squares and gardens of the wealthy, and gay people sunning themselves along Prince's Street, with its mile of commercial palaces, all beflagged upon some great occasion. See, across a gardened valley set with statues, where the washings of the old town flutter in the breeze at its high windows. And then, upon all sides, what a clashing of architecture. In this one valley, where the life of the town goes most busily forward, there may be seen, shown one above and behind another by the accidents of the ground, buildings in almost every style upon the globe. Egyptian and Greek temples, Venetian palaces, and Gothic spires are huddled one over another in a most admired disorder, while above all the brute mass of the castle and the summit of Arthur's seat look down upon these imitations with a becoming dignity, as the works of nature may look down the monuments of art. But nature is a more indiscriminate patroness than we imagine, and in no way frightened of a strong effect. The birds roost as willingly among the Corinthian capitals as in the crannies of the crag. The same atmosphere and daylight clothe the eternal rock and yesterday's imitation portico. And as the soft northern sunshine throws out everything into a glorified distinctness, or easterly mists coming up with the blue evening, fuse all these incongruous features into one, and the lamps begin to glitter along the street, and faint lights to burn in the high windows across the valley, the feeling grows upon you that this also is a piece of nature in the most intimate sense, that this profusion of eccentricities, this dream in masonry and living rock, is not a drop scene in a theater, but a city in the world of everyday reality, connected by railway and telegraph wire with all the capitals of Europe, and inhabited by citizens of the familiar type who keep ledgers and attend church and have sold their immortal portion to a daily paper. By all the canons of romance, the place demands to be half-deserted and leaning towards decay. Birds, we might admit, in profusion, the play of the sun and winds, and a few gypsies encamped in the chief thoroughfare. But these citizens with their cabs and tramways, their trains and posters, are altogether out of key. Chartered tourists, they make free with historic localities, and rear their young among the most picturesque sights with a grand human indifference. To see them thronging by in their neat clothes and conscious moral rectitude, and with a little air of possession that verges on the absurd, is not the least striking feature of the place. 
and the story of the town is as eccentric as its appearance. For centuries it was a capital thatched with heather, and more than once in the evil days of English invasion it has gone up in flame to heaven, a beacon to ships at sea. It was the jousting ground of jealous nobles, not only on Greenside or by the king's stables, where set tournaments were fought to the sound of trumpets and under the authority of the royal presence, but in every alley where there was room to cross swords, and in the main street, where popular tumult under the blue blanket alternated with the brawls of outlandish clansmen and retainers. Down in the palace, John Knox reproved his queen in the accents of modern democracy. In the town, in one of those little shops, plastered like so many swallows' nests, among the buttresses of the old cathedral, that familiar autocrat James the Sixth would gladly share a bottle of wine with George Harriet the goldsmith. Up on the Pentland Hills, that so quietly look down on the castle, with the city lying in waves around it, those mad and dismal fanatics, the sweet singers, haggard from long exposure on the moors, sat day and night with tearful psalms to see Edinburgh consumed with fire from heaven like another Sodom or Gomorrah. There in the grass market, stiff-necked, covenanting heroes offered up the often unnecessary but not less honorable sacrifice of their lives and bade eloquent farewell to sun, moon, and stars and earthly friendships or died silent to the roll of drums. Down by yon outlet rode Graham of Claverhouse and his thirty dragoons with the town beating to arms behind their horses' tails a sorry handful thus riding for their lives, but with a man at the head who was to return in a different temper, make a dash that staggered Scotland to the heart and die happily in the thick of fight. There Aikenhead was hanged for a piece of boyish incredulity. There, a few years afterwards, David Hume ruined philosophy and faith an undisturbed and well-reputed citizen. And thither, in yet a few years more, Burns came from the plough tale as to an academy of guilt unbelief and artificial letters. There, when the great exodus was made across the valley, and the new town began to spread abroad its drafty parallelograms and rear its long frontage on the opposing hill, there was such a flitting, such a change of domicile and dweller, as was never excelled in the history of cities. The cobbler succeeded the earl. The beggar ensconced himself by the judge's chimney. What had been a palace was used as a pauper's refuge, and great mansions were so parceled out among the least and lowest in society that the hearthstone of the old proprietor was thought large enough to be partitioned off into a bedroom by the new. Chapter 2 Old Town The old town, it is pretended, is the chief characteristic, and from a picturesque point of view, the livelier wing of Edinburgh. It is one of the most common forms of depreciation to throw cold water on the whole by adroit overcommendation of a part, since everything worth judging, whether it be a man, a work of art, or only a fine city, must be judged upon its merits as a whole. The old town depends for much of its effect on the new quarters that lie around it on the sufficiency of its situation, and on the hills that back it up. If you were to set it somewhere else by itself, it would look remarkably like Stirling in a bolder and loftier edition. 
The point is to see this embellished sterling planted in the midst of a large, active, and fantastic modern city, for there the two react in a picturesque sense, and the one is the making of the other. The old town occupies a sloping ridge or tail of diluvial matter, protected in some subsidence of the waters by the castle cliffs which fortify it to the west. On the one side of it and the other, the new towns of the south and of the north occupy their lower, broader, and more gentle hilltops. Thus, the quarter of the castle overtops the whole city and keeps an open view to sea and land. It dominates for miles on every side, and people on the decks of ships, or plowing in quiet country places over in Fife, can see the banner on the castle battlements, and the smoke of the old town blowing abroad over the subjacent country. A city that is set upon a hill, it was, I suppose, from this distant aspect that she got her nickname of Old Riki. Perhaps it was given her by people who had never crossed her doors. Day after day, from their various rustic pisgas, they had seen the pile of building on the hilltop and the long plume of smoke over the plain. So it appeared to them so it had appeared to their fathers tilling the same field. And as that was all they knew of the place, it could be all expressed in these two words. Indeed, even on a nearer view, the old town is properly smoked. And though it is well washed with rain all the year round, it has a grim and sooty aspect among its younger suburbs. It grew under the law that regulates the growth of walled cities in precarious situations, not in extent, but in height and density. Public buildings were forced, wherever there was room for them, into the midst of thoroughfares. Thoroughfares were diminished into lanes. Houses sprang up story after story neighbor mounting upon neighbor's shoulder, as in some black hole of Calcutta, until the population slept fourteen or fifteen deep in a vertical direction. The tallest of these lands, as they are locally termed, have long since been burnt out. But to this day it is not uncommon to see eight or ten windows at a flight, and the cliff of building which hangs imminent over Waverley Bridge would still put many natural precipices to shame. The cellars are already high above the gazer's head, planted on the steep hillside. As for the garret, all the furniture may be in the pawn shop, but it commands a famous prospect to the Highland Hills. The poor man may roost up there in the centre of Edinburgh, and yet have a peep of the green country from his window. He shall see the quarters of the well-to-do fathoms underneath, with their broad squares and gardens. He shall have nothing overhead but a few spires, the stone top gallants of the city, and perhaps the wind may reach him with a rustic pureness and bring a smack of the sea, or a flowering lilacs in the spring. It is almost the correct literary sentiment to deplore the revolutionary improvements of Mr. Chambers and his following. It is easy to be a conservator of the discomforts of others. Indeed, it is only our good qualities we find it irksome to conserve. Assuredly, in driving streets through the black labyrinth, a few curious old corners have been swept away, and some associations turned out of house and home. But what slices of sunlight, what breaths of clean air have been let in, and what a picturesque world remains untouched. 
You go under dark arches and down dark stairs and alleys. The way is so narrow that you can lay a hand on either wall, so steep that in greasy winter weather the pavement is almost as treacherous as ice. Washing dangles above washing from the windows. The houses bulge outwards upon flimsy brackets. You see a bit of sculpture in a dark corner. At the top of all, a gable and a few crow steps are printed on the sky. Here you come into a court where the children are at play, and the grown people sit upon their doorsteps, and perhaps a church spire shows itself above the roofs. Here, in the narrowest of the entry, you find a great old mansion still erect, with some insignia of its former state, some scutcheon, some holy or courageous motto on the lintel. The local antiquary points out where famous and well-born people had their lodging, and as you look up, out pops the head of a slatternly woman from the countess's window. The Bedouins camp within Pharaoh's palace walls, and the old warship is given over to the rats. We are already a far way from the days when powdered heads were plentiful in these alleys, with jolly port wine faces underneath. Even in the chief thoroughfares, Irish washings flutter at the windows and the pavements are encumbered with loiterers. These loiterers are a true character of the scene. Some shrewd Scotch workmen may have paused on their way to a job, debating church affairs and politics with their tools upon their arm. But the most part are of a different order. Skulking jailbirds, unkempt barefoot children, big-mouthed, robust women in a sort of uniform of striped flannel petticoat and short tartan shawl. Among these, a few supervising constables and a dismal sprinkling of mutineers and broken men from higher ranks in society with some mark of better days upon them like a brand. In a place no larger than Edinburgh, where the traffic is mostly centered in five or six chief streets. The same face comes often under the notice of an idle stroller. In fact, from this point of view, Edinburgh is not so much a small city as the largest of small towns. It is scarce possible to avoid observing your neighbors, and I never yet heard of anyone who tried. It has been my fortune in this anonymous, accidental way to watch more than one of these downward travelers for some stages on the road to ruin. One man must have been upwards of sixty before I first observed him, and he made then a decent personable figure in broadcloth of the best. For three years he kept falling grease coming and buttons going from the square-skirted coat, the face puffing and pimpling, the shoulders growing bowed, the hair falling scant and gray upon his head. And the last that ever I saw of him, he was standing at the mouth of an entry with several men in moleskin, three parts drunk, and his old black raiment daubed with mud. I fancy that I still can hear him laugh. There was something heartbreaking in this gradual declension at so advanced an age. You would have thought a man of sixty out of the reach of these calamities. You would have thought that he was niched by that time into a safe place in life, whence he could pass quietly and honorably into the grave. One of the earliest marks of these de gringolades is that the victim begins to disappear from the new town thoroughfares and takes to the high street, 
like a wounded animal to the woods, and such a one is the type of the quarter. It also has fallen socially. A scutcheon over the door somewhat jars in sentiment where there is a washing at every window. The old man, when I saw him last, wore the coat in which he had played the gentleman three years before, and that was just what gave him so preeminent an air of wretchedness. It is true that the overpopulation was at least as dense in the epoch of lords and ladies, and that nowadays some customs which made Edinburgh notorious of yore have been fortunately pretermitted. But an aggregation of comfort is not distasteful like an aggregation of the reverse. Nobody cares how many lords and ladies and divines and lawyers may have been crowded into these houses in the past. Perhaps the more the merrier. The glasses clink around the china punch bowl. Someone touches the virginals. There are peacock's feathers on the chimney, and the tapers burn clear and pale in the red firelight. That is not an ugly picture in itself, nor will it become ugly upon repetition. All the better if the like were going on in every second room. The land would only look the more inviting. Times are changed. In one house, perhaps, two score families herd together, and perhaps not one of them is wholly out of the reach of want. The great hotel is given over to discomfort from the foundation to the chimney tops. Everywhere a pinching, narrow habit, scanty meals, and an air of sluttishness and dirt. In the first room, there is a birth, in another, a death, in a third, a sordid drinking bout, and the detective and the Bible reader cross upon the stairs. High words are audible from dwelling to dwelling, and children have a strange experience from the first. Only a robust soul, you would think, could grow up in such conditions without hurt. And even if God tempers his dispensations to the young, and all the ill does not arise that our apprehensions may forecast, the sight of such a way of living is disquieting to people who are more happily circumstanced. Social inequality is nowhere more ostentatious than at Edinburgh. I have mentioned already how, to the stroller along Prince's Street, the high street callously exhibits its back garrets. It is true there is a garden between, and although nothing could be more glaring by way of contrast, sometimes the opposition is more immediate. Sometimes the thing lies in a nutshell, and there is not so much as a blade of grass between the rich and poor. To look over the south bridge and see the cowgate below, full of crying hawkers, is to view one rank of society from another in the twinkling of an eye. One night I went along the cowgate after everyone was abed but the policeman, and stopped by hazard before a tall land. The moon touched upon its chimneys and shone blankly on the upper windows. There was no light anywhere in the great bulk of building. But as I stood there, it seemed to me that I could hear quite a body of quiet sounds from the interior. Doubtless there were many clocks ticking and people snoring on their backs. And thus, as I fancied, the dense life within made itself faintly audible in my ears, family after family contributing its quota to the general hum, and the whole pile beating in tune to its timepieces like a great disordered heart. Perhaps it was little more than a fancy altogether, 
but it was strangely impressive at the time, and gave me an imaginative measure of the disproportion between the quantity of living flesh and the trifling walls that separated and contained it. There was nothing fanciful at least, but every circumstance of terror and reality in the fall of the land in the high street. The building had grown rotten to the core. The entry underneath had suddenly closed up so that the scavenger's barrow could not pass. Cracks and reverberations sounded through the house at night. The inhabitants of the huge old human beehive discussed their peril when they encountered on the stair. Some had even left their dwellings in a panic of fear and returned to them again in a fit of economy or self-respect. When, in the black hours of a Sunday morning, the whole structure ran together with a hideous uproar and tumbled story upon story to the ground. The physical shock was felt far and near, and the moral shock traveled with the morning milkmaid into all the suburbs. The church bells never sounded more dismally over Edinburgh than that grey forenoon. Death had made a brave harvest, and like Samson, by pulling down one roof, destroyed many a home. None who saw it can have forgotten the aspect of the gable. Here it was plastered, there papered according to the rooms. Here the kettle still stood on the hob high overhead, and there a cheap picture of the queen was pasted over the chimney. So by this disaster you had a glimpse into the life of thirty families, all suddenly cut off from the revolving years. The land had fallen, and with the land how much? Far in the country, people saw a gap in the city ranks, and the sun looked through between the chimneys in an unwanted place. And all over the world, in London, in Canada, in New Zealand, fancy what a multitude of people could exclaim with truth, the house that I was born in, fell last night. Chapter 3. The Parliament Close Time has wrought its changes most notably around the precincts of St. Giles's Church. The church itself, if it were not for the spire, would be unrecognizable. Not a shop is left to shelter in its buttresses and zealous magistrates and a misguided architect have shorn the design of manhood, and left it poor, naked, and pitifully pretentious. As St. Giles's must have had in former days a rich and quaint appearance now forgotten, so the neighborhood was bustling, sunless, and romantic. It was here that the town was most overbuilt but the overbuilding has been all rooted out, and not only a free fairway left along the high street with an open space on either side of the church, but a great porthole knocked in the main line of the lands gives an outlook to the north and the new town. There is a silly story of a subterranean passage between the castle and Holyrood, and a bold Highland piper who volunteered to explore its windings. He made his entrance by the upper end, playing a straspe. The curious footed it after him down the street, following his descent by the sound of the chanter from below, until all of a sudden, about the level of St. Giles's, the music came abruptly to an end and the people in the street stood at fault with hands uplifted. Whether he was choked with gases, or perished in a quag, or was removed bodily by the evil one, remains a point of doubt. 
but the piper has never again been seen or heard of from that day to this. Perhaps he wandered down into the land of Thomas the Rhymer, and some day, when it is least expected, may take a thought to revisit the sunlit upper world. That will be a strange moment for the cabmen on the stands beside St. Giles's, when they hear the drone of his pipes reascending from the bowels of the earth below their horse's feet. But it is not only pipers who have vanished. Many a solid bulk of masonry has been likewise spirited into the air. Here, for example, is the shape of a heart let into the causeway. This was the site of the toll booth, the heart of Midlothian, a place old in story and name father to a noble book. The walls are now down in the dust. There is no more squalor carceris for merry debtors, no more cage for the old acknowledged prison breaker, but the sun and the wind play freely over the foundations of the jail. Nor is this the only memorial that the pavement keeps of former days. The ancient burying ground of Edinburgh lay behind St. Giles, running downhill to the Cowgate and covering the site of the present Parliament House. It has disappeared as utterly as the prison or the Luckenbooths, and for those ignorant of its history, I know only one token that remains. In the Parliament Close, trodden daily underfoot by advocates, two letters and a date mark the resting place of the man who made Scotland over again in his own image. The indefatigable, undissuadable John Knox. He sleeps within call of the church that so often echoed to his preaching. Hard by the reformer, a bandy-legged and garlanded Charles the Second, made of lead, bestrides a tun-bellied charger. The king has his back turned, and as you look, seems to be trotting clumsily away from such a dangerous neighbor. Often, for hours together, these two will be alone in the close, for it lies out of the way of all but legal traffic. On one side, the south wall of the church, on the other, the arcades of the Parliament House, enclose this irregular bite of causeway and describe their shadows on it in the sun. At either end, from round St. Giles's buttresses, you command a look into the high street with its motley passengers. But the stream goes by, east and west, and leaves the Parliament close to Charles the Second and the birds. Once in a while, a patient crowd may be seen loitering there all day, some eating fruit, some reading a newspaper, and to judge by their quiet demeanor, you would think they were waiting for a distribution of soup tickets. The fact is far otherwise. Within, in the justiciary court, a man is upon trial for his life, and these are some of the curious for whom the gallery was found too narrow. Towards afternoon, if the prisoner is unpopular, there will be a round of hisses when he is brought forth. Once in a while, too, an advocate in wig and gown, hand upon mouth, full of pregnant nods, sweeps to and fro in the arcade, listening to an agent, and at certain regular hours, a whole tide of lawyers hurries across the space. The Parliament Close has been the scene of marking incidents in Scottish history. Thus, when the bishops were ejected from the convention in 1688, all fourteen of them gathered together with pale faces and stood in a cloud in the Parliament close, 
poor Episcopal personages who were done with fair weather for life. Some of the West Country societarians standing by, who would have rejoiced more than in great sums to be at their hanging, hustled them so rudely that they knocked their heads together. It was not magnanimous behavior to dethroned enemies, but one at least of the societarians had groaned in the boots, and they had all seen their dear friends upon the scaffold. Again, at the woeful union, it was here that people crowded to escort their favorite from the last of Scottish parliaments. People flushed with nationality, as Boswell would have said, ready for riotous acts, and fresh from throwing stones at the author of Robinson Crusoe as he looked out of window. One of the pious in the 17th century, going to pass his trials, or examinations as we now say, for the Scottish bar, beheld the Parliament close open, and had a vision of the mouth of hell. This, and small wonder, was the means of his conversion. Nor was the vision unsuitable to the locality, for after a hospital, what uglier peace is there in civilization than a court of law? Hither come envy, malice, and all uncharitableness to wrestle it out in public tourney. Crimes, broken fortunes, severed households, the knave and his victim gravitate to this low building with the arcade. To how many has not St. Giles's bell told the first hour after ruin? I think I see them pause to count the strokes, and wander on again into the moving high street, stunned and sick at heart. A pair of swing doors gives admittance to a hall with a carved roof, hung with legal portraits, adorned with legal statuary lighted by windows of painted glass, and warmed by three vast fires. This is the Salle des Pas Perdus of the Scottish Bar. Here, by a ferocious custom, idle youths must promenade from ten till two. From end to end, singly or in pairs or trios, the gowns and wigs go back and forward. Through a hum of talk and footfalls, the piping tones of a macer announce a fresh cause and call upon the names of those concerned. Intelligent men have been walking here daily for ten or twenty years without a rag of business or a shilling of reward. In process of time, they may perhaps be made the sheriff substitute and fountain of justice at Lurwick or Tobermory. There is nothing required, you would say, but a little patience, and a taste for exercise and bad air, to breathe dust and bombazine, to feed the mind on cackling gossip, to hear three parts of a case and drink a glass of sherry, to long with indescribable longings, for the hour when a man may slip out of his travesty and devote himself to golf for the rest of the afternoon, and to do this day by day and year after year may seem so small a thing to the inexperienced. But those who have made the experiment are of a different way of thinking, and count it the most arduous form of idleness. More swing doors open into pigeon holes, where judges of the first appeal sit singly, and halls of audience, where the supreme lords sit by three or four. Here you may see Scott's place within the bar, where he wrote many a page of Waverley novels to the drone of judicial proceeding. You will hear a good deal of shrewdness, 
and as their lordships do not altogether disdain pleasantry, a fair proportion of dry fun. The broadest of broad scotch is now banished from the bench, but the courts still retain a certain national flavor. We have a solemn, enjoyable way of lingering on a case. We treat law as a fine art and relish and digest a good distinction. There is no hurry. Point after point must be rightly examined and reduced to principle. Judge after judge must utter forth his obiter dicta to delighted brethren. Besides the courts there are installed under the same roof no less than three libraries. Two of no mean order, confused and semi-subterranean, full of stairs and galleries, where you may see the most studious-looking wigs fishing out novels by lantern light, in the very place where the old privy council tortured covenanters. As the Parliament House is built upon a slope, although it presents only one story to the north, it measures half a dozen at least upon the south, and range after range of vaults extend below the libraries. Few places are more characteristic of this hilly capital. You descend one stone stair after another, and wander by the flicker of a match in a labyrinth of stone cellars. Now you pass below the outer hall and hear overhead, brisk but ghostly, the interminable pattering of legal feet. Now you come upon a strong door with a wicket. On the other side are the cells of the police office and the trap stair that gives admittance to the dock in the justiciary court. Many a foot that has gone up there lightly enough has been dead heavy in the descent. Many a man's life has been argued away from him during long hours in the court above. But just now, that tragic stage is empty and silent like a church on a weekday, with the bench all sheeted up and nothing moving but the sunbeams on the wall. A little farther and you strike upon a room, not empty like the rest, but crowded with productions from bygone criminal cases. A grim lumber, lethal weapons, poisoned organs in a jar, a door with a shot hole through the panel behind which a man fell dead. I cannot fancy why they should preserve them unless it were against the judgment day. At length, as you continue to descend, you see a peep of yellow gaslight and hear a jostling, whispering noise ahead. Next moment, you turn a corner, and there, in a whitewashed passage, is a machinery belt industriously turning on its wheels. You would think the engine had grown there of its own accord, like a cellar fungus, and would soon spin itself out and fill the vaults from end to end with its mysterious labors. In truth, it is only some gear of the steam ventilator, and you will find the engineers at hand and may step out of their door into the sunlight. For all this while, you have not been descending towards the earth's center, but only to the bottom of the hill and the foundations of the Parliament House. Low down, to be sure, but still under the open heaven and in a field of grass. The daylight shines garishly on the back windows of the Irish Quarter, on broken shutters, wry gables, old palsied houses on the brink of ruin. There are few signs of life besides a scanty washing or a face at a window. The dwellers are abroad, but they will return at night 
and stagger to their pallets. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Edinburgh, Picturesque Notes, by Robert Louis Stevenson. I've never before read from this book, but it is absolutely wonderful. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. The description also includes links to ways you can support this podcast and keep it ad-free for everyone, including becoming a member of our Patreon, where you'll get exclusive perks available nowhere else, or dropping a one-time tip, no subscription required, at buymeacoffee.com. I hope you take the time to check them out. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.